I point out that um, what they are saying or they are doing is actually, you know, offensive. And um, that, that is actually unfortunate that they should do so. And uh, because I see them, um, and I, in a sense, black consciousness also taught us, you know, that as victims, you know, uh, because when they act, they act as if they are the dominant, you know, partner. But in fact, they are, they are suffering. They are victims of a system that has indoctrinated them to have this superiority complex. You know, this is a superiority complex. And hence, you know, BC, Black consciousness was really a response effectively, you know, to that spirit of dominance, spirit of uh, uh, domination, you know, political domination, economic exploitation, um, social discrimination and all of that. I think my first instinct would be to report them, um, depending on the severity of the situation. But also there's this, this um, aspect I want to bring in with what the Bible says, you know, when, when you are struggling with someone is bring a witness and then go to the, the leader or the authority. So um, as that's definitely a battle, a constant battle that I'm having. Um, but yeah, I definitely, I, I think I'm gonna go with the, the situation because what if it's in a family setting, you know, and what if it's in a, a workplace setting? Well, I guess it depends on the context, whether is it, let's say I'm a black person, they're a white person, are they saying something racially offensive against me? Um, I would like to bring it back to the church. So body of Christ, one in Christ, we should be of the same mind. So if I'm a black brother and my white brother says something towards me that I find offensive, I mean then I think the Bible shows us that if my brother is sinning against me, I should approach him personally and say, listen brother, this has actually offended me, this hurt me, or I've, I've, yeah, whatever, um, and to explain to them. And if they, if they say sorry, I must forgive them. Um, even if they fall seven times and they say sorry seven times, I must forgive them all those times. But if they don't repent, then I can take a witness and I eventually can take it to the church leadership, etc. So I guess that's, maybe that's something that we should be also a bit more open to in the church is to encourage that. We don't want to, I guess, look for offense, but if there's, if there's hurt, if there's, if we sin against each other in the church, we should be, have the liberty to say, well, the scripture says, I can come to you and I can just address it with you. To be quite honest, it, it does depend on the environment because um, some instances ha have, it's been difficult to, to boldly address racism because, you know, so much is at stake at the same time. It takes you a while to get to, you know, this position or place and you have to find corners to address that this is not great and sometimes you actually keep quiet because you're so afraid of that power that is you know in charge or, or evident so it really depends on the environment if I am at a, at a restaurant I'll speak out you know because I'm in the position of power as a paying customer but where I am the person being paid for a job I trade quite differently. We want to just like you can't say things like that and trying to correct but it you know unleashes fights and it becomes difficult but we're always trying so if it comes in a conversation where I don't really know the people sometimes I might be quiet a bit or you know I don't want to overstep but I am always conscious about like should I say something should I not so yeah it is it's a hard balance yeah I stand my ground because I know that I am on the moral high ground I, I, and I know also now that I'm in a sense I'm also f rooted in biblical teachings I know that I am on God's side because God is against all of racism discrimination all of these things and I'm always encouraged by Acts 10, because the Holy Spirit there had to intervene in respect to Peter, you know, and, and in relation to Cornelius. And that intervention by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God, um, to teach him that 
it was there was no place for this superiority thing uh, by the Jews vis-a-vis -vis the Gentiles. And that to me then says, insofar as God is concerned, he has got love for all of us in our diversity. If I am a white person and a white brother or a friend or family says something racially offensive, I do find that challenging. I think maybe my personality is I don't want to confront people unnecessarily. So if it's a believer, then it's, it's easier because then you know, brother, uh, once again, I would have to, I guess, get the, a sense of the time and the situation right to say, okay, brother, you are saying this, maybe the first time I'll let it go, but if it's a pattern, this is something that's not, that's not cool, it's, not, it's, it's, it's wrong. And, and this is what the Bible shows us, and we need to address that. It's easy for me to say it now. I guess it would be very challenging to, to, to do that in real life. So if it was a believing brother, a believing white brother saying some racial offensive, I would have to, I would, I would have to address that. If it was a non-believing brother, I would be even a bit more hesitant. But I know that I, that's something I need to speak up. So, and that's challenging, right? I mean, I, there was one, one example in my mind that it was a, it was a family member his friend or acquaintance um, and we were sitting and having I think after lunch and somehow we approached the topic like of racism and they were very I guess conservative Afrikaans and they had quite I thought quite racist views and I tried to, and, and uh, I wouldn't usually do this but I tried to challenge them and we got in this heated debate and I couldn't stop myself from he would go on and I would go on and we would count each other and it, it, it was actually was not good so we uh, he got worked up I got worked up and we got nowhere I, I, the poor people around us I don't know what they how they felt about it but that was really not a good conversation so yeah there's there's a, yeah it's, it's difficult I think and maybe sometimes I don't stand up enough for what is right but I guess also the the, the relationship kind of dip, uh, kind of gives you the clue as to how much you, you can engage how heavy that message that you can give across luckily for me there's, there's not much a, a, a person, a white person can say racially that is so offensive that I've never heard before, I've never been, been subjected to. Um, so for me, I just, and luckily that the gospel has broken me in this area of racism, but rebuilt me up. And God has put so much confidence in me. I can sit with any white person. I don't have inferior, I have to feel inferior, I don't care. In my eyes, we are all equal. You are not superior. So, so luckily for me, I'm there. I'm not worried about the people that throw racial slayers. Those are, not, those are not the problems. Your biggest problems is people that sit in the same room as you at church. They, they say they love you. They're your brothers. You know, you share the same spaces. You go to gym with, you cycle, you play golf with these white people. But inside their hearts and how they, they carry out white supremacist ideas. For example, you've got a business. You make sure intentionally that you only do business with white people. Meanwhile, you smile at your black friends and whatever in this, you for transformation. But meanwhile, that's what you do. You don't, you, you're not intentional about transformation. You know, you sit, you're the HR manager of a company. When it comes to increases, you're only giving to white people. But you're smiling with black people. Your friends is this, yeah, my, this, I've got a black friend, I've got this. But inside in your actions, are very dangerous because that is what's crippling society is those quiet actions that are a problem not the racial slayers the racial slayers are good from our own people who are very naive to say racism exists because you've got those people no i've never experienced racism yes and we know you might have not but some people even fail to put themselves in other people's shoes so when those racial slayers come then they get to realize okay this thing still exists so it's for them but for a person like me who lives with this thing on a constant basis and advocating for justice and solving these problems i don't mind about those people i'm concerned about the silent ones that that are making these decisions that makes us and control economy and all of that yes i have i didn't know it was tokenism like some people might not realize that things are racist, um, was that, as I said, with white friends before if going to a party or an event with them and being the only black person, they would happily or call me a token, the token black girl. And I would receive that, I'm like, oh, okay, is this what it's called? And, you know, perpetuate that narrative and not think that, wow, how did my 
friends know about tokenism and I don't because here am I thinking that we're all friends but they can definitely say you're the token black girl and um, so much so that if there's another black guy at the same event or whatever they'll be like Sam there's a guy for you um, just because he's black so there was no thought of I might not even like this person or we might not even get along or that might not even be my preference but just because they were we were the only two black people in the room we have to be together. I don't think I've been a token, <laughs> but I think, I don't know, maybe I'm, I've got a black friend, so he's, he's the token of my non-racialism, I guess, if, if I can say, oh, this is my, I've got this black friend, so I'm not a racist. I'm cool. I don't have to worry about uh, racism in my, in my heart because I've got this black friend. But then once again, it becomes more, is uh, the reality of the relationship, the friendship, and what is, the, is there a dynamic there that's unhealthy? Am I seeing him as a, as a black friend? Um, once again, I mean, we our skins, we have it, and we have our backgrounds, but we are equal. I mean, once again, in Christ, we are equal. So I don't want, I wouldn't also want a black friend to feel like they might be a token friend. Um, but I think that, that will come through in the, in the, in the relationship, yeah. No, I think for myself, I, I don't personally feel that I've experienced any tokenism because I don't personally feel that I had a, um, that I was positioned or, or framed in any way um, for that purpose um, and so I always always with my experiences I felt like where, wherever I've been appointed or wherever I've needed to be connected to I think that that there was definitely a sense of transparency and openness and and a sincere engagement. I've definitely seen it or not from personal experience but I am aware that some people feel or even are given jobs or certain opportunities based on race or gender or things like that in order to try and you know balance the scales that previously were not balanced so as I'm still a student and I haven't applied for jobs yet I yeah, haven't experienced this myself but I am aware of it and I do see it in my friends talking about it and sharing their experiences so it is still a thing, but again, change doesn't happen overnight and it's going to take some time for everything to be e more equal. Yeah. Uh, tokenism is basically, I call it fronting. So it's a facade, you're pretending um, something is there but it's not there. Uh, and mostly it's done in, in terms of PE, affective action and stuff like that. You put you know, to get to be a level one PE contributor, for example, you put a female in the board somewhere, they don't ever say what's happening in the company, but you do it anyway, and you get your level one PE. I've never experienced it myself because I refuse to be part of such a system because it's ungodly, it's unbiblical. Because at the end of the day, you, most of these people that have seen uh, occupying seats of, because of tokenism lose their souls for riches. Yes, they've got money, they sit in, in, in posh uh, suburbs, they drive nice cars, but what about the people? What about the other people in your organizations? What about, you know? So you lose your soul for riches, so I refuse to be part of that. Ah, oh, personalize my challenge, yeah, I think my, my challenge is, and I can see this within the workspace, um, and I can hear this from the background of my family. Uh, that there was, from, from my family's background, colored people aspired to be more white because white was superior. Um, and that's how the thinking was. And so with that, on the backdrop, it was that black was on the, on the, on the lower end and colored was, you know, you were evolving, so you're a bit more closer to the white end. And so a colored person would actually then predominantly look down to a black person, um, thinking that he's a bit more evolved or better. And so within today's context, um, that we have a predominant uh, black uh, uh, government, and when I say black, I'm particularly talking not black uh, colored, but, but black as in black African. So it, it would feel now that there's the struggle now to be a bit more black, or how do you actually now lean towards about being more black so that you can uh, gain more access to what, what is being offered. And I think that's a real challenge for for colored people and it and it feels as if like you you torn in between the white and the black and the history and it feels like 
the colored people doesn't have a specific voice or recognition. And it definitely feels also that the term colored has been um, forced, um, imposed onto a colored people. And that's your name and that's your heritage and that's who you are. Um, and so I think for myself as a colored person, if I could decide within South Africa, I'd say that I'm not colored, I'm South African. Um, but because we need to be classified for statistical reasons, I think uh, I, would then, I would then recognize that I'm black, I'm African. Um, so it does bring that tension, yes, it does, for a colored person speaking from a personal perspective. So I certainly can't speak for them, but I'm assuming it's similar to what black people are experiencing. I think anyone who is not white experienced the same type of discriminations, but again, I might be wrong. It might, there might be different experiences. There's a systematic process that is designed to ensure that the educated and the uneducated black person is kept poor. And by that I'll explain. Number one, the economy is held purposefully all over the world in the hands of white people, majority of white people. Now, my biggest problem with all of this is why is the church so many years so comfortable with this? Why, why is the church comfortable? Because it's an ungodly system. It, we, we need to have an, a, a, a godly economical system that we tap on. Number two um, is the unemployment rate of black people. The unemployment rate of black people is a problem and the poverty rates of black people is a problem. And number three, I would say, is the, um, is the financial institutions. You know, when you go access to funding as a black person um, and the terms that you get, the interest that you get, you become high risk. You know, you can come with the same guy, your same white counterpart, you went to school, you come out, you go, you know, ask for funding, he gets a bad deal, he gets a better interest, you get an interest. You should live the same similar life, there's no issues, but you are high risk. So that system also is, is a problem. That's a very broad question. Um, I think the challenge that we experience is still in our education systems. Um, and just that the quality of it, never mind what we are, the content that we are being taught, it's just the quality of it. I think we're still lacking in certain areas um, and I think something I had this conversation with my mom and she she had said that um, the the way that the the Cape Town CBD has been built and structured and the way that the rural areas has been built and structured is such a way to make sure that it's difficult for people to get into the CBD where all the businesses are and where you can come and really um, work yourself and earn a good salary and so I think um, I think that, that that is still based on a very old system um, that this whole, Cape, this whole Cape Town plantation was built on. So, at, and so for, for someone that's living in the, the rural areas, they have to wake up at 4 o'clock to get to the CBD at 9 o'clock. Where someone that, is, that, that, that has the privilege of, of living near to the CBD can wake up at like 6 or 7 and get to the CBD without that... Um, public transportation issue? Uh, maybe being stereotyped in a way. I guess if I'm a colored, if I'm a, a colored guy, um, they might expect me to have some gangster kind of vibes going maybe. So yeah, I think maybe being unfairly stereotyped, and maybe this is wrong, but like in, my, in my perspective, it seems like part of, the, of our sad history is the fatherlessness in communities. It's not just, the, I mean, it's not just the black and brown, certainly, but maybe historically, maybe white families were more intact than brown or black families. And I think that's a disadvantage that still has repercussions. Um, so you're probably more likely to grow up in a poorer community where there is more crime, more drugs, more gangsterism, um, less healthy father figures in the home. Um, so that's certainly gonna put you in a, in a, on the back foot.